write that down for me, Saito. I'm Justin Nipper, and this is Write That Down with Fumi Saito. Fumi, hello. Hello from Tokyo. How are you doing? Did you good, have a good weekend? Good. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so we got some pretty good feedback last week about our first Ke- Keiji Muto. Of Keiji yeah. Muto. Yeah. yeah. So um, thanks to everyone with the kind words. Robert Silva, thank you so much. Thank you very We're much. we start with part two today. So, so let's start. We, we left off around kind of 1995, 1994 Keiji Muto's career. So he's really, he's cooking. He's on top in New Japan. He's, he's the guy. In 1993, he won the NWA title from Masachono. Uh, we were earlier, we were talking about. Uh, yeah, we got, his, yeah, we got corrected. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> right. Because I There's was talking top to of my head. Through. And uh, not that I have some people said it was either, this guy's an encyclopedia of Japanese wrestling. But no, no, I just. Some things, it's not like I remember every little thing and dates and well, I years. think you know more than everyone else, though. But not, not the year and dates. You know, yeah, I was, we'll I was there and I watched it and I'm more into what really happened around that time period, you know? Yeah, that's the important. Yeah. And so, uh, yeah, to, to collect, you know, like uh, uh, to go back. Uh, yes, Great Muta. Not the Keiji Muto version of it, but the Great Muta beat Chono to become NWA World Heavyweight Champion uh, 95, right? I'm sorry, 93. Oh, no, 93. 93 January. See, see, see. I'm <laughs> mistaking. See, that was like, oh, we got to go back to 91, let's say. 91 March, Tokyo Dome. Okay. Fujinami beat Ric Flair in a con- very controversy, you know, controversial yes. fashion. And in Japan, Fujinami won. And WCW Television two referees and over the top rope finish and all these things. And the, the title quickly returned to flair in Japan. People were led to believe Fujinami won the title, just like the old days. Right. But in the following May, you know, uh, May 19th, 1991, Fujinami flew out, you know, back to the States, St. Petersburg. That was a super brawl where flair defending his NW World Heavyweight title against Fujinami. But in Japan, it was like a title up for grab. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Yeah. It was interesting. But anyhow, the, the, it was Chono who won the vacant NW title at the G1 Climax of summer of 92. So it was summer. He became Mr. G1. G1. Yeah. August. Yeah. And also, it was funny that... Uh, WCW program and WCW magazine at the time said it was big upset. Chono beat Rick Rude to become NW title, right? It wasn't even a big upset if you lived in Japan. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Yeah. And it was yeah. instead, it was like, a, who the hell is Rick Rude kind of thing? Yeah. yeah isn't that interesting? I think that I, or- I felt like I saw that when I would go to the Tokyo Dome when the ROH guys were there. I mean, the, the ROH guys were great wrestlers, but I don't think the, the crowd was convinced that they were big stars just like rick rude was it's just the nature i mean we it's, it's the same over here too when the japanese wrestlers come over if they're not produced and, and right with right all way. the here and video clip and all these things and storyline all these things yeah yeah exactly right. so but that, that that's just the nature of the business especially in the early 90s yeah then they'll go back to what we were talking great muta beat that chono to become nwa champion Fib, uh 93, 93, January 4th. Mm-hmm. Then you told me about the fan. That was the name, name of the event at the Tokyo Dome that night, uh, that year was a fantastic story, right? Mm, yes. Yeah, so I had to go go back and look it up. And the funny thing is, though, that the Great Muta Chono NW title match, it wasn't even the main event. 
No, it was maybe Choshu Tenru. Yeah, there it was. I don't even think it was a semi main event. I think it was maybe third or fourth from the top. Uh, seventh match out of 10 matches. Yeah. Yeah. And then there was a uh, Hellraisers, you know, the Power Warrior, Hawk Warrior against Steiners that, too, you know, that night. And a very interesting match, like, you know, Masa Saito, Hashimo, you know, Shinya Hashimoto against, against Dusty Rose Jr., who is Gold Dust, you know, Dusty Rose mm. Jr. and Scott Norton, you know. And uh, mm. there was a Ron Simmons against, you know, Tony Holm, who was Ludovic Vorga, you know, a little bit mm-hmm. later on. And Tony Holm, he worked as. And there was a Liger against Ultimate Dragon, and a very really interesting lineup. Very good show, very big show. I think there were 60,000, something like that there. Yeah, the number, yeah, like a 63,000, but but that's what New Japan office announced, you know, in, in mm-hmm. uh, most of the, the, the newsstand sports paper, if you remember. Oh, well, you know those, you know, sports paper in, in, in Japan that the, you can pick up every afternoon at the, any at the convenience yeah, store. subway station, the train station, and it's uh, very much reading oriented printed, you know, print media culture in Japan. That is also dying here because when you go to subways and trains now today that nobody's reading newspapers nobody's reading magazines it's all you are looking through your iphone you know just mm-hmm. like america but uh, right yeah at the time yes yeah for a long time you know there was so many there's so many you know sports page tabloid uh, that uh, like a you know new york post uh, uh type of you know Daily news. Yeah, yeah, that kind of thing. I mean, not just one, but dozens in, in Japan. And the, mm. most of them covered wrestling, you know. And, uh, anyhow, that was the day that Great Muta beat Chono to become NWA, at the time, NWA World Heavyweight Champion. Then he traveled to States. That's when he dropped the NWA title to Barry Wyndham at Asheville, North Carolina. A little later on. Yeah, well, February, the following month. Yeah, just a few, yeah, about a month later. Yeah, yeah, dropped yeah. It to Barry Windham. And then was he immediately back in New Japan, or did he stick around WCW? Uh, he came back right away, yeah, I think. Uh, I think a few months later, he had a match with uh, Hulk Hogan, who we talked about a few weeks right, ago. Right, the same year, that uh, 93, mm-hmm. May. It was a Fukuoka Dome. Mm-hmm. Fukuoka Dome. Uh, Hulk Hogan made appearance, you know, first time in six, seven years. And it was single match, Hulk Hogan against Great Muta. Yeah. And from from around this time, yeah. From there, he he was. I don't. I didn't see him too many uh, big title matches. That when the more we saw Great Muta, it was more of like a character, like a doing an exhibition match. Yeah, like during the year, Undertaker. Or yeah, something. yeah. During the year, he was Keiji Muto. You know, hmm. that's how we talked about it last time, the last episode that the Keiji Muto was not going to do the great Muta gimmick in Japan when he came back mm. from WCW for the first time, you know. That's what he did in America, you know, face paint and, uh, you know, the blue, you know, the, the mist and the, all the, the heel, you know, very traditional heel. heel yeah, and then an all, almost stereotypical Oriental Japanese character, right? Mm-hmm. That he didn't think he was going to get over. And also, he didn't want to... You know, look like you know the copycat of great great Kabuki, you know, who was 80s superstar. Because Great Muta was introduced in WCW as a son of Great Kabuki, so so that the, he did not want to you know associate this you know American storyline into Japanese scene and, and and but ended up playing two different characters, you know, like one night you were Keiji Muto and another night you were Great Muta, the heel, and then uh, it's like uh, Dr., you know, I don't know, Jacko and, Dr. and, Jekyll and Mr. Hyde, Hyde and, you know, and then they, people had trouble, you know, understanding that character. But at the same time, Great Muta merchandise was selling like crazy. So the company, the New Japan company always wanted to use Great Muta as a mm. different attraction. So he had, the, Muto himself had to adjust. Okay, when he does Keiji Muto, you gotta do the straight wrestling, you know, like you work like a Keiji Muto, you know? But then, then what can you do when you do the great Muta? You just have to be extra, you know, 
you have to do that, do, do something extra, like like a like a supernatural heel kind of thing, mm. or and, theatrical. Yeah, I think so. Yeah, but he, for some reason, when he, you know, it, this uh, May May third, nineteen ninety three. Uh, wrestling Dontaku at the Fukuoka Dome when he had single match against Hulk Hogan, he chose to be Great Muta instead of Keiji Muto single match. So he chose yeah. that. Yeah, I guess. Yeah. He, then also, New Japan was expecting that footage to go to WCW. I see. Yeah, because okay. 93 was a one-year transition that Hulk Hogan made quite a few trips to Japan, but he was right in between WWE and WCW signing. He wouldn't sign with WCW full-time until 94. So, mm -hmm. yeah. I don't know uh, if there are anybody out there that can correct me. I don't know if there was ever shown on WCW television in the States. I don't remember that, but if it was... Uh, yeah, they, no, they wanted to, but uh, they still did not have the rights. You know, they were even... WCW was always, see, I, I spoke with quite a few people from the, the, that time period that um, they, WCW didn't even think Hulk Hogan, they could sign the Hulk Hogan for one thing, right? But they did. Mm. But the, they were afraid he, they weren't going to be able to use the name Hulk Hogan. They thought the Hulk Hogan, the name title was trademarked by w, w, WWE. Oh, really? Yeah, so they didn't... I think, never knew that. Are we going to be able to use Hulk Hogan? And then they insisted the Hulk Hogan. No, Hulk Hogan is Hulk Hogan. And then also, they were the, the legal team were doing the research on the likenesses. That, would it be possible for WCW to use Hulk Hogan with yellow trunks and yellow boots? You know? Because mm -hmm. <clears throat> that was the, the point that, the, they, that the, you could argue at the court. W, I see. Yeah, WWE... Might WWE though, and Vince McMahon could sue Atlanta and Ted Turner company and WCW all three as a you know like a trademark infringement you know mm -hmm. that likeness right. of Hulk Hogan that hairdo and the posing and uh, you know all the way down to costume to ring name to everything else. If you remember when when Hulk Hogan signed was WCW in spring of 94, they changed Hogan logo, right? There was right. no writing on Hulkamania on his yellow bandana. It was Hogan. slightly different. Hogan, Hogan, mm. same color. See, obviously WrestleMania, that the word WrestleMania, Hulkamania was trademarked and it was protected by WCW, I mean WWE. So, uh, they were going around the corner and yeah, they found out they could use yellow color, the same trunks and everything else, but not that Hulkamania logo or WrestleMania wording or anything like that. So they were so careful about it. That's why probably they did tape this match though. Of course, that was in Japanese television that the footage exists, you know, but uh, Hulk Hogan and his great mother was going to be used in WCW, I mean, WCW television. You know, during some sometimes during '93, but they kind of mixed the idea. I believe this was also the match where the Great Muta ran down the long Fukuoka Dome uh, ramp for the clothesline. Yeah, yeah, okay. He did it a few times, but I, I remember that image when you watch New Japan old New Japan footage. That was always in the, one of those opening clips. Oh, okay. He did that at the Budokan too. You know, like a, oh, he did it a few times. Yeah, like a, I mean, like a fifty-yard dash, right? Something like that, yeah. <laughs> yeah, and to do the clothesline. Yeah. Hmm. But it was... This footage you can watch in America now, right? Somewhere. Oh, sure. You can watch it. I think it's on New Japan World. Okay, New Japan World. Because this is one of the matches American audience should watch and study Hulk Hogan because it's not the Hulk Hogan you think it is a Hulk Hogan style. Same yellow hmm. trunks, yellow boots, everything else, but <clears throat> not the you and three punches to big boot into your leg drop to go home. Nothing like that. He really wrestled, you know, that was, a... he could do it too. Of course. Of course. We it, talked it about that. Uh, yeah. We talked about that last week and on our show a couple of weeks ago about Hogan. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I, yeah, I, 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 I would, cause I'm always defending Hulk Hogan for sure. For sure. <laughs> cause people have wrong idea about him, you know, like not being like, 
good i don't even want to use the word good worker or something because people so casually use the word oh he's a good worker not knowing what really means you know mm. sometimes but uh, yeah but so this is one of the matches that uh, people should watch how Kogan or for for great muta for that matter because when he does great muta when he wrestles as keiji muto he makes sure that he, he wrestles differently you know and in ways, he's kind of the perfect opponent for a Hulk Hogan character, the big superhero versus the mysterious Great Muta. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, kind of like a, that can be televised in America, and, and the, 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 the meaning is the same, you know? Mm. Yeah, positioning is the same. Anyhow, yeah, so that was, uh, we covered the 93 January Great Muta winning NWA title and back to America and in North Carolina, Asheville, North Carolina. He dropped the title to Barry Windham, but he did come come back and had the uh, Fukuoka Dome single match against against Hulk Hogan the same year. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah. And Big year, and it just continued to get bigger from 94, 95. Yeah. And also you mentioned, you know, people that they asked you about the Keiji Muto Hiroshi Hase against Steiners, right? That's one of my personal. Uh, I love that match personally, and I, I that's the following year. Like, that's ninety four, Tokyo 94. Dome. Yeah, Battlefield, January fourth for sure. It's a Tokyo Dome, you know, tradition. But it was ninety four. It's called Battlefield in Tokyo Dome. Yeah, that was Very yeah. That the main fighting match, the Steiners against um, Hiroshi Hase and Keiji Muto. Oh, it was mm -hmm. good because I, I had. See, not that I remember, I can memorize everything, but uh, for, during that time, if Hase was making a tag team with Muto, where is Kensuke Sasaki, right? I think that was before. No, 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 no. Kensuke Sasaki, and Hiroshi front? Hase against Steiners were 91. Oh, 91. That's yeah. The, you, Maybe the most most famous one or the more famous yeah, one. Yeah, more famous because it was Steiner's debut match in Japan. Yeah, and we were talking earlier when I was actually visiting Japan a year and a half ago <laughs> and Fumi-san was doing a kind of Q&A at the Todokan Wrestling Merchandise I was? Store. In okay. You were, yeah. yeah. Okay. You were interviewing Rick Steiner. Ah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Of course, of course. And so many... What was that? It was a couple years ago? About a year and a half oh, yeah, ago. Oh. Like... Uh, Bad uh, memory or something. <laughs> because uh, he, Rick Steiner was in town for Jimmy Suzuki's show. show. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah. So most of the questions that we heard from the crowd were about that match. Yeah, Hase Kensuke against Steiner's. That was 91, their debut yeah. match. And also they had this double teaming, you know, Bulldog and uh, other, you know, like a double teaming from the, the corner or the Tequila oh, yes. Teki Sunrise or all those things. And the first time, Japanese audience actually witnessed Scott Steiner's best looking Frankensteiner that day. Yeah, and and Steiner screwdriver. Yeah, Steiner screwdriver. Right, right, right. That and, was a big reaction. Amazing reaction. And Scott Steiner knew it and he ran around the ring and he knew Right, he, right. Because they come up with new moves that well the kind of suplex oriented, but the mm -hmm. Steiner brothers always came up with the bunch of stuff that people haven't seen you know it was always amazing and great athletes you know yeah but anyhow yeah this your favorite muto and hase against steiners that's 94 and i was wondering where the hell is kensuke sasaki here and he, yes he was the hair raisers that night ah okay power yeah kensuke sasaki as power warrior teaming with hawk warrior going up against Scott Norton and Hercules Hernandez, the Jurassic Powers. That was their peak. Very uh, underrated, or not, it's not talked about enough, that team of Hercules and Scott Norton, because they, they were created to be the, the regular opponent of Hellraisers. You know? Uh, to, all four of them are just, you don't see guys like that too much anymore. Four big, big, big dudes. <laughs> Actually, big Kensuke Sasaki is the littlest one in there, you know? Which is funny because he's also huge. Yeah, but not as tall. In his own way. Yeah, yeah, he's in way. his own way. Yeah, like a real powerhouse for Japanese, you know, wrestler. And uh, and also that I always, another, another you know, character that I always kind of defend because um, uh, today's fans 
don't understand the hair razors as much. You know, probably a lot of, I'm not bad mouthing that the program, but uh, you have your, what's that, the TV documentary on pro wrestling? Uh, Dark uh, Side? Dark, mm, Dark, Dark Side, yeah. When they did the Road Warriors piece that, uh, see, Mike, uh, Hawk, you know, Mike Hegstrand, Hawk, already deceased. And the only people they could, you know, interview was obviously, you know, st still around the animal, uh, Paul Erring and the Minneapolis wrestlers like Barry Durso and them guys, right? Mm -hmm. But uh, they treated they treated this Hellraiser's portion so poorly, you know? It's There's a lot more to that part of the story with uh, Minnesota and Brad Renegan. Yeah, yeah, but yeah, of course. And also... It, they they you know they treated that story like yeah uh, Hulk went to Japan and cut his own deal, right? And uh, they kind of almost treated Hellraisers as a joke, like a knockoff of Road Warriors. No well, knockoff, fine, but the, um, it was treated as something really. Somebody like Road Warrior Hawk, like uh, the member, let's say member your Aerosmith or Rolling Stones or somebody, you know, coming to Japan and actually signing an exclusive contract with Jap you know, Japanese company, then took, you know, native Japanese wrestler as his full-time partner, you know, partner, you know. Then they came up with matching costume and came up with, I mean, they really toured Japan. Hellraisers had their own run and it was very, very special for 90s Japanese fans. You know what I'm saying? And you still see the merchandise and the t-shirts and the videos today pretty regularly if you're a Japanese wrestling fan and you go around to Japan like Todokan. Yeah, yeah. Power it stuff. really gave um, Kensuke Sasaki his superstar rub from, you know, Hawk. And Hawk treated this Japanese run as something special that he, something he, he's done on his own. Because Road Warriors, you know, he, they already had 10-year run, on, you know, before that. And he wanted to do something different, but didn't want to, you know, Hawk didn't want to call it New Road Warriors or anything like that. So he, he had to come up with his name, name. And they did not have the name of the official name of, for the team until they start the actual tour, you know. Mm. And Masa Saito had a feeling that, that they could use the name New, New Road Warriors or something like that. But the, Mike said, no, no, no. Uh, Road Warriors means animal and hawk. You know, he's so willing to do this, you know, venture. He he was so you know willing to give his time, and he had a full time contract with Japan and have Japanese uh, Ken Kensuke Sasaki as a partner, full time partner. And he wanted to, he took it as like his new run, you know, and uh, he was listening to Ozzy uh, Ozzy Osbourne, you know, you know, song at the nightclubs in Roppongi, you know, and then they were playing Hellraiser. Hey, Reza, you know, mm. and asked the bartender, what, what, what's the song? Is that a Black Sabbath? No, 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 it's Ozzy Osbourne. All oh, right, solo, right? So it was a ting ting in his head, you know. The Iron Man, Black Sabbath was a theme music for the Road Warriors. This is going to be a new run, another run, new chapter of his wrestling career. And he felt that, right. Not Black Sabbath music, but this Ozzy Osbourne song is perfect for a new run, and, and named the team Hellraisers. That's it's it. like his solo project. Yeah, it's uh, epic. Yeah, yeah. Then uh, yeah, so there was a back to Keiji Muto, right? So uh, this uh, time, you know, January. So we're <laughs> January 94 and then 95. We last week we talked about his match with Nobu, Nobu they, they, Yeah, yeah. But there was another Tokyo Dome match the same year, 90. Uh, Fukuoka Dome, not not uh, uh, Tokyo Dome, but Shimoto. May. Yeah. Uh, no, Great Muta against Antonio Inoki. Antonio Inoki's final countdown before his re actual retirement. That's right. He his, did that uh, about a year yeah. and a half, two years. Like, uh, Antonio, you know, like a 50 some year old Antonio Inoki taking one opponent at a time, like a final to have a final single match against very meaningful opponents. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And Great Muta against Antonio Inoki actually happened in 94. In 94. Yeah, I was there. 
what was the reaction to the Inoki versus Muta match? It was actually mixed because it was always rare to have Antonio, actual Antonio Inoki, you know, putting tights and, you know, tights and shoes and actually wrestle, you know, around that time, you know. So he only did maybe once or twice a year. But when Inoki wrestled, he really worked hard to put himself in shape, like a one match shape, you know, that uh, he, yeah, that he worked a very interesting match. And the finish was very interesting that uh, he, Antonio Inoki putting sleeper hold on, on Great Muta, sleeper hold, you know, but it's not fading, you know, not, not giving up, not tapping up, but he's still squeezing uh, squeezing the sleeper hold. And, and then he let, let it go, then and, 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 uh, he covers one, two, three. So the, ah. that was the only time I watched, I saw sleeper hold was the move that beat guy one, two, three. You know what I'm saying? As a pin. As no a solution. pin. Yeah, isn't that interesting? Yeah, I and, only usually see that in video games. And that I, I, it's one of the, those moments where the, you, you always remember it because it's the only time it really happened. Yeah, so... And also, Inoki doesn't juice that often, right? <laughs> so it was bloody Antonio Inoki. Mm. Yeah, when it's you, always yeah. No, it's always a little special when you see the blood on the opponent, like a like a '92 with Hase as well. You always remember those matches with Muta because of the again the theatrics. Yeah, because great Muta does the extreme heel thing that he used for an object. He uses cheer. He uses this uh, crawl bars, or I mean, anything in the building you can grab on. And he uses as a as a, as a foreign object, right? And, and he even cut Inoki's forehead open. Like, oh, to that you do that to Inoki? Oh my gosh, right? Wow. <laughs> yeah, but it was an interesting night at the Fukuoka Dome. You know, Inoki against Great Muta, uh, Shinya Hashimoto against Fujinami. You know. And uh, Hiroshi Hase against Riki Choshu single, you know. And w- another interesting one was uh, Masa Chono against Fujiwara, y- Yoshiaki Fujiwara, you know, mm-hmm. single match, you know. And, uh, and Rick Rude against Sting. Very interesting. I, is, is that where uh, Rick Rude hurt his back? Probably, yes. I think it was. Yeah, that was, yeah, and then he, that was it, and he called it quit, right? Pretty much. That was his last match, I think. He couldn't wrestle after that. Right, right. But the, that was around the time that all the, not all, but the, so many American wrestlers, especially guys from Minnesota, <laughs> you know, uh, yeah, lots. Took, took on Lloyds of London insurance. Ah, Mr. Perfect, Rick Rude with it. The, yeah, you know, got a lot yeah of oh, God, that. yeah, yeah. So, uh, after after a while, you know, Lloyds of London stop signing professional wrestlers because they're gonna collect it, you know. Right. They realize they realize that, that wow, these guys are going to get hurt, you know, and a sure mm. thing, right? So, or even if it wasn't all that bad, you can still apply for this insurance, and doctor will say yes, these guys are disabled, you know. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Nothing for out about it, but uh, yeah, but that's a side story of it. But uh, yes. Great Muta against Antonio Inoki did happen in 90, uh, May of 94 at the Fukuoka Dome. That's something that the people are, if people are interested in, they should watch it. Mm, you can find that. And, uh, the, World, just sure. like we just went over this, you know, the lineup for 94 wrestling Tontaku uh, from Fukuoka Dome. I think every single match is interesting. On this card? Yeah, yeah. Because the opening match was young Kojima against young Nagata, you know? Ah, you know, like the third this, generation. Guys. Yeah, and then uh, Ishizawa El Samurai against Takayu. And the old early, time. Uh... Ishizawa, of course, later on, yeah, Kendo Kash, Kashin. And uh, yeah, everybody, you know, if you follow Japanese wrestling after that, like, wow, watching first match is interesting because these guys were in first match once upon a time, you know? Yeah, maybe it's a good uh, starting point if you wanted to get into this era of uh, New Japan in the 90s is wrestling Dondaku 94 with um, in Fukuoka. Yeah, funny thing is like, uh, that kind of makes me old, but the, you know, 90s are like really ancient for younger fans today because huh? it's, it's what, 26, 25, you know, 26 well, years. It's not that long ago. I remember it. Yeah, but the, when you think about the movies from 26 years ago, <laughs> you know, it really depends on the, on the quality of yeah, it. Yeah, it, yeah. The good ones never, they never, they always feel the same. They always feel good. 
And like, yeah. like, like you're saying about the Inoki and Muta match, it doesn't feel dated. Because uh, it it's an art piece. Yes, it's a masterpiece. Mm. Oh, God, yes. And um, they were they didn't have to focus on any uh, gimmicks other than just wrestling just because of how they were and how uh, the personality they both had big personalities in the ring and they both clashed. It was it, and uh, actually it told they itself. do very little in that ring. If you think about the today's standard, how many big moves are there? You know, like it's doing a whole bunch of big moves and kicking out isn't necessary is a formula for good match you know doing less is doing more right sometimes so these both had like 100 percent charisma just and that's all they really just by do. standing and walking around even like took two or three four minutes before they even locked up you know mm-hmm. locked up right so, or they, they had a face off on the ramp before they were even in the ring yeah yeah so those are the things yeah yeah, so maybe just bounce like, off the rope, just bounce off the rope and spit mist into the air, and and that's it, but no contact. Yeah, for a long time. Yeah, that's good though. Actually, it like uh, smart. If some you know, if some people have this you know idea of what makes good matches, it's not one sided. You know, it's not one dimension. It's like multi dimensional. It's like what makes good movie, what makes good music. You know. It's not guitar solo that could, makes good song. It it could be rhythm. It could be lyrics. It could be the you know that you know it could be anything, right? So it could be a, what the situation needs. Yeah, yeah. So it's simply. like that should that should be applied to wrestling match too. You know, these guys do what they do so unique, original way that you just have to sit and watch instead of being judgmental. You know, you know what I'm saying? Mm. Yeah, 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 absolutely. So that was no, no. The today's a part two of Keiji Muto. Yes. Mm. So we, yeah, we're in the mid '90s by now. '94 was a big year. '95, he won the IWGP title from Hashimoto in Fukuoka Dome, same venue. Yeah. It was also the year we talked a little bit about it last week with uh, UWFI and his matches with Takada. That's not. That was '95, wasn't it? Ninety. That was '95. That's right. '95 and '96. There were two. Yeah. So from '95 and '96, I think there was a match from around this time where he also had. Uh, it was with Jushin Liger, and we saw another. Uh, layer of Jushin Liger too. It was another one of those more theatric magics. It was a with the, when Liger had his mask ripped off and there was the makeup. Do you recall that one? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, right, right. Yeah, no titles involved. It was just like an attraction. Yeah, oh, yeah. You didn't need that. You didn't need a title, single title, or anything. But the Great Muta mm-hmm. against Liger, what they would do, and they all surprise you. And Liger is such an artist that the, well, he'll come up with something that people don't expect. I mean, like. Uh, Putting makeup, you know, great muta like makeup, Liger makeup underneath the mask, you know, yeah. I was a big part of New Japan's history. I think I think that's one of their uh, their highlight real moments in the intro show to me in my head. I, I see that that's one of the things that is so New Japan. Both both uh, wrestlers are two guys that you always automatically associate with New Japan, even though. They both went around the world, and Keiji Muto didn't spend much time in New Japan after the 2000s. Right, right. Well, year, year, yeah, year, to, year 2000, he spent the entire year with WCW. Yeah, Pretty that much. and that was and he, totally different. And yeah. he really witnessed the dying day and of dying day of Nitro in WCW from inside. Mm. I um. I had a meet, not, not a meeting, but you know, I used to bring my Japanese tourist to do, you know, the summer. It's called Body Slam Circuit. That uh, I take like a five, fifty to hundred Japanese tourists to go to America and go watch WCW Nitro and Summer Slam WWE and ECW Arena and visiting a wrestler at home and all this in one week period. And there was a day that uh, we spent one afternoon with Muto. Wow. Yeah. It must have been great. Yeah. What well, did everybody you... get picture taken with Muto and get autograph and and, and a nice lunch with Muto. And then he was saying that the uh, WCW is going down <laughs> openly, oh. openly. <laughs> well, I, I don't think he was treated too well there, Ben, the scenes from what I've read. I oh, mean, yeah. And then heard... also, that was a Vince Russo days, too. And plus, uh, 
year 2000, you know, how terrible Nitro was and, and, and people try to forget about it. But the, do you remember they brought in a whole bunch of rookies and the new guys into Nitro, like a powers that be? And uh, I mean, a whole bunch of guys, I forgot their names. Sure. Chuck Palumbo. Oh, of course. And Sean O'Hare. Yeah. And they, <laughs> some of them ended up in Japan a little after that. With the WCW and New Japan partnership. Mm. Yeah. And there's another uh, guy that the, who did the mic, mic work a lot, Mike something. Mike, God, see, so hard to remember. Uh, Mark Jindrak? Yeah, some, yeah no, he was a big guy. He was a big guy. And also he came uh, to Japan and then went to Mexico and he had a nice career. Mm. But uh, see, it's hard to remember. There's a the dozen guys that was occupying uh, <clears throat> who did the most mic work, you know, instead of working in the in mm -hmm. the but they introduced uh, like a dozen guys at uh, Nitro, right? And uh, to fill up three hour Nitro and the Thunder the following day, which kind of nobody watched. But uh, Muto, Keiji Muto was watching this, you know, from inside. That this company is going down, you know. And uh, that was uh, during the time that he had to do Great Muta every week. He was never he Keiji Muto. Right. And he was placed with uh, Vampiro. Yeah. Yeah. Vampiro is fine. Yeah. But hmm. uh, they were telling him to do the moonsault every week. And he, he told them in the office that he has bad knees and doesn't do the moonsault. If he did that, probably once a year. That's about it. But uh, Vince Russo and his guys knew only Keiji Muto with moonsault. So he was telling him to do the moonsault every TV match. He's like, no, I ain't doing it. Right. It's like, he had problem with that too. And also they never told guys what are the <clears throat> script or the story for the next week's Nitro because they're changing every week. That like, got messed up, you know? And uh, yeah, yeah. He hated every minute of it though. <laughs> Keiji Muto, yeah. So is he living in the States or is yeah, he flying yeah, back he, and forth? No, no, no. He was living in the state the whole year. Ah. Yeah, yeah. And Chono would show up around this time too. I remember him showing up on TV in the late nineties or two thousands. Uh, actually, Chono, Chono, Chono was the one who did the initial NWO Japan uh, storyline. Then Great mm -hmm. Muta joined it. So Chono, yeah, that was around yeah ninety seven ni ninety five ninety six ninety seven. That NWO Japan thing lasted about three years. You know, mm -hmm. uh, not just just. Masa Chono, but the Tenzan, Hiro Saito, and uh, uh, what's a fake sting? Uh, that uh, Je Farmer, Jeff, Jeff Farmer. Farmer. Yeah, he had the fake sting in Japan. And also Scott Norton. Uh, Scott Norton. Or Scott Norton in Japan, but wearing NWO t shirts and, and a beret. Mm -hmm. Yes. And then they had like a 10 guy crew, you know? And yeah. uh, they did. Uh, and, and when NWO were dying, they quietly switch that to team 2000 with same black yes. t-shirt because they look the same look the same but they are afraid that uh, you know that not afraid but new japan and wcw business kind of start falling out right and hmm. uh and nwo thing they could probably like a new japan couldn't use the nwo logo anymore or something and they are afraid so they quietly switched the gimmick and the t-shirt and all the logo into team 2000 same, you know, Ch Chono as top guy. And uh, yeah, so people are not supposed to notice it. But then again, NWO t-shirt was so big that people were wearing it, like a rock and roll t-shirt at the mm. time. Yeah. Then Muto joined the NWO, but the, instead he decided to spend the whole year, the 2000, because he was, I, I think he was like uh, looking in the uh, New Japan offices changing period. And hmm. uh, he should just kind of uh, disappear for a while and, you know, like, uh, do like observe everything from outside, watch WCW and American scene and uh, look, you know, look New Japan from far away side. And then you, what happened is he never went back to New Japan after that. So he, he used that time <laughs> to kind of study his next move, study for his next move. Yeah, and then also he felt that he was like getting stale because he was mm. back home in Japan for 10 years and had this IWGP champion run, great Muta run, 
and you know long hair to the beard one to you know he tried to do different things you know and uh, domestically you could do so much that you know the what other people cannot do is that Keiji Muto can leave and go to America and fit right in. This is what he can do. He's an international superstar. Probably, you know, Shinya Hashimoto is so so Japanese, right? That mm. he probably don't want to leave home and, you know, go to America and then be in WCW dressing room for the entire year. That would be really hard for Hashimoto to do. But Muto mm. is an international superstar that, well, no problem. I, I'm, I'm going to America. See you guys later, type of thing. Yeah. He could adapt really easily. And he has a, and he already had such a, not legacy, but he had the proper experience. He was all over the world by the time we were talking 2000s. He had already. Yeah, been and also you have St- people like a Sting and Steiner, the good friend of Muto, you know? Mm. Yeah, yeah. He kind of helped bring that style up. I mean, with along with the stars of WCW at the time. So he kind of fit right in from. Yeah, the and then also not just fitting, but the, uh, you know, those 90s superstar all respected him, you know? Yeah. Yeah. And actually, uh, did you know Goldberg respected him? What's the story with that? Yeah, Goldberg was saying that uh, Muto, in in Goldberg's opinion, he thought Keiji Muto was the best wrestler ever, ever. What did he base that on? Just watching him or did he have matches with him? Uh, they didn't have Goldberg didn't have single match against Keiji Muto un, ever, I don't think. And two years later, when Muto was doing all Japan thing, all Japan Muto brought Bill Goldberg's in for the for big money, you know. But uh, at the time, Goldberg was kind of hurt and didn't even do the sledgehammer that uh, he had to use spear as his finish, and it wasn't hundred percent. But uh, they, Goldberg was like, a, you know, superstar that the people were waiting that uh, to come over, you know, for the first time. And uh, they did a lot of interviews. And he was openly telling people that the, he really felt the Keiji Muto was the best ever. I mean, best wrestler he's he ever watched. Have any other foreign wrestlers said something similar about? Oh, uh, more than one, more than one. I, I can recall uh, yeah, like a lot of people did say, because that's why he got the nickname during 2000 run, year 2000 run, that the, the master of wrestling, Keiji Muto, mm-hmm. right? Yeah, the genius. Genius, yeah. So, yeah. And also the very animated, you know, uh, that the way he moves, you know, that's, uh, you know, that, that the flashing driving elbow thing, the snap mare into elbow, like real fast. That, mm. Yeah. Or, or the, uh, what's the, we call it sokten elbow, that the, you know, that the cartwheel into elbow, into the corner. Uh, handspring elbow. Yeah, handspring elbow, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Dana Brooke <laughs> thing, yeah, <laughs> yeah. That, the, <clears throat> those things, see, Muto was doing it in his rookie years, but the, these are the original. See, Muto is the type of wrestler who is not going to just use somebody's move. He, he has to be all original. Moonsault, yeah, there was a moonsault before Keiji Muto, but he was the one who made it into a very famous move, you know. And after Muto, people start doing it, you know. And, and he has his own sequel. He's you got to do the the Schmidt backbreaker. You got to do the backbreaker right, 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 right. first. Schmidt, but then the walk over the guys. Then and when then, it, yeah, the climb, then, yeah. Then doesn't even go outside the apron. He's gonna climb the turnbuckle. And he doesn't do a variation. He doesn't do it on the floor. He doesn't do it to the side. It's just it's that KG Muto right. style and one. lower and faster and and farther out. You know. Yeah. No. No air. Just all snap. He snaps back. Right. Snaps back and far away. Like very far. Sometimes not very in the far. middle of the ring, but farther than that. Like a two third away away from of the ring. Yeah. 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 So that's like he really really put his own little ingredient in in there his twist yeah yeah original it's his version and his rhythm even when he does certain moves when he gets up he looks like muto yeah i think 
like you're talking about the flashing elbow earlier or the handspring elbow. I think we we notice those because a character like Muto spends so much time slowly walking around the ring and staring at the opponent, staring at the fans. There's nothing happening until he explodes with just one. Dang, he runs so move. fast, like yeah, like so animal. Really, yeah, yeah. Hmm, it really, really. Uh, that's what I think helps us. It's a rhythm, it more. rhythm. Yeah, yeah. He's very economical with his movements. He just uses well, it because when he had bad knees for 20 years, mm. and he learned to work around it, and he made career out of it. Yeah, and even still, he's oh today, yeah, oh yeah. Oh God, Modern. 58. No, no, we haven't even got there yet, but uh, oh, yeah. we're far away from it still. <laughs> right. Today's 58 year old bad knee, artificial bone put in. Muto does the Frankensteiner. Yeah. 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 And he's a champion again. Yeah. He's back in the news. So, so but the, during 90s, so he had these runs and uh, yeah, and then he had a, you know, this 95. Nobish Kotaka, the UWFI against Muto match that the people thought was a sure thing. Takada will go over. Uh, uh, uh. So we learned a lot about it, though, because it's New Japan's show. You know, people didn't realize it was Riki Choshu Booker, New Japan show. And the reason the UWFI, New Japan, all, you know, all out war, this Takada Muto single match happened because. UWF International was losing business, you know. Until mm. then, they were arrogant. So we saw that kind of half a year feud between the two companies. Yeah, yeah. Before, into '96, into '96, '96. In and, January, and 90s, ja yeah, January, January of '96, the Nobuhiko Takada did go over on Hashimoto to, to win, win the, uh, uh, the, to go over on Muto again, you know, for the. Mm -hmm. So they the they, yeah. they did one win one lose you know but yep. the saddest part is though people don't remember the one Takada went over always always remember the very first match that Muto beat Takada why don't they remember Takadas <clears throat> that's the funny part of the, the, how people you know remember things see when Misawa beat Jumbo Tsura for the first time epic right. The Misawa, you know, that the get, getting rid of Tiger Mask mask and he becomes his own person and new green emerald green costume and you you start becoming Mis Mitsuharu Misawa. Then you have very important single match against the legend Jumbo Tsuru and Misawa beat him for the first time. One, two, three in the middle of the ring. Historical moment. People do, you know, people remember the match real well. Very following tour, you know, the, a month, one month later, Jumbo bring at the next Budokan show. Nobody remembers that one. It's not, not fun. people's huh? memory is a very funny thing, right? Why is that? Does that make sense? I, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I mean, I get it, but I don't know what the main reason is for people. They just want to remember the. I guess they just want well, to remember people, the people. Well, people remember things the way they want to remember. Yeah, you do that. I do that. You know what sure, I'm saying? sure. Yeah. So hmm. there were, I mean, oh, in reality, Keiji Muto against Takada happened twice, you know? Yeah. One win, one lose. Just like, you know, fair, fair wrestling business, right? But in a big feud like this, almost like a political wrestling feud, you know, company against company, you have to beat the guy first. That's the only match they remember, people remember. The first meeting. Yeah, yeah. yeah. That's funny. I learned about this because I do remember Takada beating Muto, you know, win back, you know, like uh, three months later, the following year, you know, January's Tokyo Dome, same matchup. Takada beat Muto this time, but people don't remember this one that well. The so always first encounter, how, how big the show was how Muto was so good that uh, that was the night the lot of wrestling fans kind of gave up on UWF, you know, UWF idea. Must be. Yeah. And between that and then, well, Takara is a different path. It's a different story. We could go on all about that, but we should probably stick with Muto. Oh, no, of course, of course. It's a yeah. too big of a subject because UWF so is something that the people believe they were going to change wrestling into legitimate contest. 
and uh, yeah, that's a whole new concept that that you know we have, we can talk about it episode after episode. After episode. Yeah. yeah, it's almost but, still going in its ways. But, yeah, um, because right. after UWF philosophy and other things, and the, they're going to Pancras type of era, and you really become MMA, you know. Then that's and around the same pride. time global global phenomena that uh, things like UFC start happening, you know. Not today's UFC, but uh, back then they said it was Ultimate Fighting Championship by Gracie's, you know, and that was all new things. And still had the link between MMA and wrestling business then. But that's yeah, another that's subject disconnect. for another day. Yes. yes. Yeah. So let's, let's <laughs> go from around. So it was 99. So he was in WCW for a while. And before that, he yeah, was doing the NWO. One year, yeah, NWO. Then during this NWO Japan period, they did do that back and forth tour, back and forth. You know, Great Muta and Masa Chono appear a few episodes of Nitro was NWO Hulk Hogan and, you know, Nash and Hall and all these guys, then, you know, uh, to make sure that the NWO Japan is really affiliated, affiliated with America NWO and, you know, American audience on Nitro so Japanese, you know, wrestlers as a part of NWO. Then they show that on Japanese television, right? Muto and Chono went to America and then they did this you know, thing with Hulk Hogan and, you know, Six and National Hall, and right there, real NWO, and then they were really doing the business, you know. And every tour, you know, they that the N that the WCW didn't really send their guys, but the day occasionally they send in guys like a you know Buff Bagwell or you know that the actual NWO member from America, and they toured Japan. Scott Hall, I think. <clears throat> Scott Hall and Kevin Nash were the most expensive ones so they only work mm. a couple times i see yeah oh, oh, not the regular tour but more like a tokyo dome fukuoka dome type of show mm, yeah that makes sense yeah nash hall so, and x uh, not x Pac, but at the time it was a six sean waltman my friend yes one two three kid yeah they um, yeah, they work tokyo uh fukuoka dome yeah but around, but after the WCW run, because, like I like you said, Muto mentioned that the company was going out of business. So late two thousand, early two thousand one, he he did come back to Japan, but he came back through Inoki's um, Inoki Bombaye, Inoki Bombaye, oh, Inoki yeah. Bombaye show, right, and right. I, <clears throat> it was at the time not complete hundred percent MMA show though. It's not like Muto came back and worked MMA match. It was a wrestling match, professional wrestling match in that MMA-like atmosphere. Of course, the producer, Antonio Inoki, wanted, to, wanted people to think it was all MMA, right? But uh, yeah, Muto came back and worked the show. And that was a very, that was a night he had a hoodie on. And then uh, as he took the hoodie on, wow, he shaped his head. He's bald. He's like Steve Austin or Goldberg. <laughs> With goatee. Yeah. Yeah. But goatee. the new look, new look. New it looks good though, because because long hair was a little thin and top, and he had to do something about it, you know, for a long yeah, time. Yeah, I remember some of those. <laughs> he looked like uh, do you remember Robin Hood's you know, his merry men? <laughs> kind of look from in the middle, it's well, it it's like. not that it he had more problem than you and I can talk about, you know. So sure, okay, okay, but he came back with the cool new look. Oh and he God! Actually, with, he teamed better. up with his opponent, his his rival, at the show. He teamed up with Takara. He yeah, teamed up yeah, against uh, I believe it was Ken Shamrock. Yeah, Ken Shamrock and um, Don Fry. Right, Ken Shamrock. Yeah, uh, and Takada in it. Inoki mm -hmm. thought people believe he was MMA. Nah. <laughs> I mean, by then, 2000, it was Pride was already established. Yeah, Pride. Pride was huge. Yeah, yeah. And I had trouble with that. Yeah, K1 and Pride. K1 too, yeah. K1 and Pride using professional wrestler into MMA match, you know, because rest, professional wrestlers are a lot more famous than any MMA fighters from any, you know, like Russian MMA or some American MMA fighters. 
they're MMA fighters, but are are they popular? Are they famous? Always, always professional wrestlers are more famous than any MMA guys. And I'm not talking about today's UFC, but the early MMA era. Early shoot fighters. Yeah. Strong link with wrestling business and uh, MMA business. And uh, MMA always needed professional wrestler to participate on the event. And the bad thing was, though, see, <clears throat> Japanese dark age of, prof- you know, dark years of professional wrestling begins because people like Kendo Kashin, people like Yuji Nagata, you know, you know probably a, Nakanishi or somebody, they were all college wrestling champion, you know. Nakanishi mm. went to Olympic and everything, you know. But, uh, and also Yuji Nagata, yes, national college wrestling champion. And he was... He went into MMA match with two day training, two days <clears throat> against Crow Cup against, and uh, uh, or the Federer too. <laughs> it's crazy. almost like it's like practical joke. It's like getting, you know the the late night shows. It's something they would do to one of the comedians, put him in against, put somebody who's completely inexperienced in this field against the master of the field at the time. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> and he was champion, wasn't he? Wasn't he? I w- yeah, so he was like a, Inoki pulled almost like a, it was as if Inoki pulled the trigger on his own company. Yeah, and that's that fascinates a lot of fans because <clears throat> it's hard to get into his mind. What what was the reasoning? What was the thinking behind I that? I think Inoki was all ready to leave and I was like a, sure enough, evidently he sold the New Japan company to you know, the Ukes, the game company a, few, a couple of years later, right? I think he was all yeah. ready to do that, you know? And also, uh, he was no longer, no longer, Inoki was no longer active professional wrestler, you know? And uh, he was still famous, more famous than any. Um, around that time period, you have, you know, you know the old Misoka, the New Year's Eve, New Year's yep. Eve, you have NHK have this big singing, you know, pop music festival thing and yeah. a, a other network channel, Channel 4, Channel 6, Channel 8, each had their MMA show all night long, right? Yeah. And one's K1, one's Pride, but the third production was by Channel 4. It was Inoki Bombayé that I think Inoki was like his own company by then. You know, mm-hmm. yeah. New people. It, it was after UFO, wasn't it? After or UFO, was... and UFO was never a, a real company. Like you know, they never cooperated themselves. They're not. You know, it was like a more of a more of a name of the like name angle? name of the show. You know. Uh, I see. I see. Yeah. See. Just yeah. New Japan corporate. You know, old Japan company company. And but the mm-hmm. UFO right after he retired. You know. And he took people like now, you know, Naoya Ogawa, and uh, he, he used Satoru Sayama as an advisor, and used his guys, and uh, he was creating like a right between MMA and professional wrestling type of thing. Mm-hmm. But that was it worked during eighties and nineties, you know, like a very MMA ish professional wrestling. But after Millennium, real MMA was happening, right? Right. You couldn't work MMA matches anymore. Because we know what it, uh, what it looked like. To look like. Yeah, yeah. So I think Inoki miscalculated a little bit on that, you know, aspect of it. And again, that's probably another show we'll have to do something. Yeah, yeah, because in Inoki's heyday, he could pull it off. Every he was even the work matches, work MMA, he was telling people for decades. I don't know about other people's wrestling, but my wrestling is real. And people, that was Antonio Inoki's philosophy. You know what I'm saying? We, I grew up watching that. <laughs> it's a different different kind of um, mindset to get into. But... Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, Inoki, uh, uh, as the big hint, Inoki was like uh, Hulk Hogan and Vince McMahon in one person. Yeah, that's a good <laughs> way to put it. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hey, they... Probably looking like that, yeah. 
Okay, so let's wrap it up for now. And next week, we're going to come back with part three. We have talk to, because about... Ke- Keiji Muto is such a, such a huge star. Maybe the biggest star of our time, right? And he's still if going deep. strong. Yeah. He's, I saw the picture of the weekly pro wrestling. He's on the cover of that this week. Yeah. It's like, he's, it's like nothing ever really changed. And also, ways. that will bring back the history lessons that the Keiji Muto with IWGP belt. Right, and Keiji Muto is triple crown belt. Mm. Now Keiji Muto is GHC belt. Oh my gosh, he really did work all three major league of professional wrestling in Japan and become champion. And uh, he always uh, means relevant. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, and yeah. I think also that using Keiji Muto in 2001 in all Japan will give us a really good glimpse of what that- we call the. Dark age. Dark age begins, and also Giant Baba dying '99 and yeah. uh, struggling all Japan, and you know, Miss, Mrs. Baba and Misawa and his guys all leaving the it's company. Like a... Everybody but Kawada and Fuji. Oh God, it was like new century. I felt it was. Yeah, it was like you know? BCAD kind of. Yeah. Like, yeah, it was, it was it, scary. And you think about it. Well, now I have goosebumps. Yeah, it's twenty. It doesn't seem like it's been twenty years. But we gotta go into, you know, uh, part three. We have to do this part three because Keiji Muto done so much, and uh, by going through what what happened year two thousand, two thousand one, two thousand two, into more current stories, that w- we will have understanding and clear picture. I mean. Uh, like a clear understanding of bigger picture. Mm. Yeah. And uh, we'll have all the details next week. So let's we'll start the dark ages. With <laughs> dark Muto. ages. Well, it doesn't sound yeah. good, but the, yes. Uh, but it's very interesting. And we, we need to, because that's where I felt, that's where I really kind of fell off as a fan for a couple of years. Oh, did you? Was, right. Because it was right. splitting apart in the States too, at the same time. Like yeah. The entire yeah. Industry oh, became. okay. Okay. Oh yeah, of course. And also when two, year 2000 came and we really felt, the world would be a new place, right? And a lot mm. of things did happen and in wrestling and your life too, you know? And yeah, mm. yeah, of course. But next week, the, the ne- episode we'll do next week, it's going to connect yes. the episodes we did. All the way to, to the current everything. scene. Yes, yeah. The part it, so. three of KG Part Muto. three. Let's do it. That's right. So before we go, um, yes, sir. We can find us on Twitter. Uh, Fumi, can you? Yeah. Um, Twitter name Fumihiko Dayo, F U M I H I K O D A Y O, Fumihiko Dayo on Twitter, or just Fumi Saito on Twitter. I mean, uh, on, on Facebook. Message me before friend me. <laughs> yeah, and I'm Justin at Justin M. Nipper on Twitter. Uh, next week, get ready for part three finale of Keiji Muto. So, so long from Tokyo.